hello, 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 as Ellie Crow would say, if, if she was interviewing me for a crime I didn't commit, or a crime I committed, I suppose. Anyway, um, here we are. We're going to have a chin wag about so something that comes up a lot. This kind of you, the use of the word alcoholic. Am I an alcoholic? People kind of talk about this term, and there's lots of different points of view out there. And somebody, we were talking about this on a Q and A in the Facebook group a few weeks ago, and um, yeah, I mean, like, there's no right or wrong here thing. This is just that we just wanted to do something to put, hopefully, put something out there that's like, what's the word? Not loaded with personal opinion, where we're pointing at a lot of different ways of looking at it, and and just have a chat about it, right? Mm. just have mm. a chat have just a chat have a chat it. yeah yeah it's I think it, it's it's an important subject right because I think it's the thing that keeps can keep people stuck and certainly for me it would have sorry I'm just fiddling with my earphones because I get on my tit ends oh no I can't <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that that, no, absolutely not <laughs> That is staying in. Ellie's got new headphones and uh, they're annoying her. That was a colloquialism <laughs> for how, how annoying they are. <laughs> because we're at the caravan and so I've got a different setup and it's the first time I've recorded here that it's weird because they're noise cancelling. Anyway. I thought you were going to say we're at the caravan and when we're down here, we just speak in like, you know, <laughs> we have a different way of speaking. <laughs> dialect. Yeah. <laughs> Caravan speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so what? So anyway, Sam's going to edit that bit out. What I was going to say was, uh, it's the it, it's the thing that I think can keep people stuck. So when I was approaching the end of my drinking career, and I I really didn't like the space that alcohol was taking up in my life. I didn't like the mental space it was taking up. I didn't like the amount of decision-making that was going on around it. I didn't like the fact that I felt... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I would describe it as controlled by it, but it was like um, th there, was some, th there was some kind of hold over me that I wasn't happy with because it left me feeling like I was incomplete without it. And so it didn't matter what the occasion was. If alcohol wasn't present, then I would feel like I was missing out in some way. I would feel deprived. And there was, I suppose, then like an element of, and, I, and again, I wouldn't have described it like this at the time, but the the unease was from like a level of fixation with it so you know like when you go out not that we went out a huge amount but if we went out somewhere it'd be like right well where's the bar who you know who's getting the round in what are we having and then the first one would usually go down fairly quickly right when's the next one um where's the next one coming from hang on a minute, other people haven't finished their first one yet. <laughs> no, I have, and I want another one. Um, so I, I, I didn't like the, I didn't like the, I, I want to say like talents, I had like talents. Mm. The, the, there was some, some element of like too much importance being placed on it. It, it just didn't, the, the balance just didn't feel right. And it was certainly very different from how I'd felt years before but if somebody had ever asked me a brush the subject of addiction or said anything like have you got a problem with it or are you an alcoholic I think I would have that that would have created quite a visceral reaction in me and I wouldn't have wanted to contemplate any of those things because the, the story that was available for me at the time was that very much this misconception that there are two types of people and I didn't want to be that type of person. I didn't want to be the type of person that has a problem and uh, therefore I'm somehow defunct, there's something wrong with me 
and my punishment for there being something wrong with me is that I need to I need to basically adopt a life of misery and abstaining because the issue is me and that that as a as a concept kept me very much away from any kind of consideration of it's a problem of course I knew it was a problem because I was worrying about my health and I was worrying about the reliance that I had on alcohol for stress release relaxation it was bar yoga was my only means of self-care which seems incredible now but of course that's exactly how it was so I think this subject is really important because words language has a lot of power and influence and I I would have it's almost like I'd have rallied against that and then perhaps gone further down the road that I was going down as opposed to when I came across this naked mind and Annie Grace there wasn't use of the words addiction and alcoholic. It was very much this opening for there's nothing wrong with any of us. What we're dealing with is an addictive drug. And so it was a very, it felt like a very, very different space to, to dwell in and to explore in that was grace-based and much more um, much much softer and more welcoming I suppose does that make sense yeah it's really funny because um I can actually remember sitting and talking to my mate a good while back now probably 10 years ago I couldn't tell you and um I can remember us talking about how we wanted to like stop smoking weed and and all these and stop going out partying and raving and all this stuff and uh, I can remember him turning around to me and going um well this is the real problem isn't it and he held up this can of Adnams like a ale from the UK this is the real problem and I was like what I was like you think that it's for you and he was like yeah and he sort of like said it and, and we had a bit of chat and, and we moved on and I can remember sitting at the time and thinking and this was at a time where I was drinking crazy amounts and um I was just like huh I'd never even, I was very aware of these other things in my life that seem to be having an impact and perhaps because they're like, they stand out a bit more because you can't just do them anywhere and there's already a judgment made on them by society at large. But I hadn't really considered it about booze. And, and I think the thing with that is at the time, I was already really dependent on alcohol. I already had an alcohol use disorder, depends, you know, however you want to look at it, right? Talking from a scientific down the line, point of view like I had a wonky relationship with alcohol but there's this thing it's like the difference between nouns and adjectives that's really weird anything where you say you are a thing so if you say I am an alcoholic or if you say I am an addict it has an idea of like your entire self-identity is wrapped up with that thing now if you drink alcoholically or if you're addicted to a substance right um and it's a descriptor of, of an element of what's of something that's going on rather than a definition of who you are. It has a different loaded thing. And we see this when we describe it, the way that we use language and what it is and isn't okay out there to say, when you describe someone as being a, mm, it has this feeling about it. that's very different. So I don't know. I, I just, I just had never thought about it. I just, I'd never thought about it. Um, and if someone had gone through it, when the time was right and when I started really thinking about it and I came across it for whatever reason more by sort of I feel lucky rather than judgment and it was more luck than judgment I sort of stumbled across quite a few of the new school kind of ways of looking at alcohol use or addiction or whatever it might be called and um so I never sort of I I, I don't know I think it was because I was already into podcasts and stuff like that and perhaps because I'd read a lot about it and because I'd already like I knew about Alan Carr and you know his way to stop smoking and all these kinds of things I had a knowledge of CBT and all these kinds of different things and so mm. I think I found my way to it through that but yeah like I got asked that question a lot though like oh so so were you an alcoholic then or did you 
and it's really funny to me now to reflect on it because I, it seems very clear to me that the word alcoholic or addict, it doesn't actually exist. It's like a thought form. It, it's, a, it's a word that has a load of thinking around it. So to one person, an alcoholic will be somebody who loses their job, loses their wife or their husband. You know, it's the Hollywood style rock bottom, drinking out of a brown paper bag you know, physically addicted to alcohol where they'd need to go into some kind of, um, you know, somewhere medical to try and help them kind of detox, that that would be it. And for another person, it would be anybody who can't enjoy their life without alcohol. You know, if they were like, oh, I'd need it, they'd be like, oh, well, I think that's that. And so we get a load of thinking wrapped around it, um, depending on our uh, definition of what the word might be. And that's that's to do with who we are, who we're brought up with, how we, all the thinking that we've developed around it is informing our kind of like the feelings that we have around it as well. So to someone, the word addict is like, it's re- it can be useful. Or it could be something that they might even find empowering in some ways. And for another person, it's something that feels really oppressive and dark and they just wouldn't go there ever, you know? So um, yeah, it is, it is important and it is powerful. And um the words themselves are sort of, they're not really pointing at anything specific. I think that's what science tries to do. Alcohol use disorder is trying to point at a spectrum. It's not trying to point at anything in particular. Yeah. It's trying to say like there is a spectrum of use and it's disordered, which is another word that comes under fire. But ultimately it's, it's you know, it's uh, it's troubling to the person. And, and that's why addiction essentially in in, um, in psychology is not really based upon the amount consumed or anything. It's the impact it's having on the person and their life. Addiction is not, is, exactly. is defined about um, by impact because someone might be drinking, you know, whatever, whatever it is, an, an amount a day, and it's not having any perceived impact on them on their life. But ultimately who gets to decide that? Well, only we can ever decide that because only we know what we really feel like internally. No one else is going to be able to tell us that. Mm. Um, so it's up to us to decide and empower ourselves. And so it is a, it is a really important discussion, this definitely. Mm. And it's low for a lot of people. Mm. It's a loaded one. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Innocently. I think that, yeah. 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 There, there's just, there's so much built up around this, you know, there, there are invested parties, right. For, putting the blame for alcohol use disorder on the person as opposed to the substance. So there are people, companies making a lot of money out of being able to sell alcohol and they want to continue to be able to sell it and they want to use directives like drink responsibly. So that you know within marketing it's like let, let's show all the pictures of the people who can drink responsibly who are actors probably not drinking whilst they're in the ads and then shame on those other people over there that can't drink responsibly and that's a really it's really subtle because it looks like an act of kindness in the sense of that well what we'll do is yeah. we'll, we'll as an act of kindness we'll let everybody know that it's their responsibility to drink this addictive substance responsibly because yeah. yeah so the other day i walked past a gambling shop i don't know what it was something in the uk and there's a massive poster on the front saying like you know basically gamble 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 and then at the bottom it says you know don't ever gamble uh irresponsibly or do that i can't remember what kind of language that they use and it's like to me with the gambling i'm like oh that's so freaking obvious that that's basically just like a get out clause um but we don't see it so much with the alcohol because it's just so normalized and so you know the kind of things that we see at christmas where the adverts are going out you know the the the, the government might release something that's like um those kinds of you know adverts that you see where there's the horrific car crash or whatever and then at the bottom it says you know please don't drink and drive or whatever drink responsibly and it's a government mandated kind of um whatever you call them like a program and then the, the big alcohol takes them and like stamps it on the bottom of the posters or and all that kind of but it's like so some of this is not even like intentional it's accidental but the implication behind that is oh you need to do it responsibly and if you can't it's your fault mm-hmm. and so we're just going to carry on happy as larry and where is this larry anyway this original larry. larry he must have been really happy original the original <laughs> Larry (laughs) but yeah I mean it's and so yeah so this is about seeing really clearly 
what or just try and, and just being aware that there's a lot of really subtle messaging going out there that's not like i think there's this idea that there's like four evil dudes in like suits like ha 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 in the smoky room kind of plotting and planning i don't see it like that it feels like this kind of it's bigger than one person or a group of people it's this organism style thing you know big alcohol is a profit machine that wants to make money and so it will you know because it wants to improve the bank balance year on year it's it wants to protect itself so it'll do anything it can to do that and so it's not it's not necessarily that evil things can flow through it in the sense evil in the sense that it can harm a lot of people but I but it's a uh, it's like it's not uh always planned by like a group of people that are like you know the same with mummy wine culture right it's grown and it's developed and I don't think it's like necessarily that anybody within those groups or companies was like, ha ha ha, maybe there are a few, but like, I think it's just grown out of, of, of profit and the need to like target new demographics because the old demographic is like not buying as much as we want them to, or, you know, constant mm -hmm. growth is, is a requirement of businesses in the world that we live in from in many of them. So it's, it's, that's, that is that energy that's pouring through stuff and we we get hit by that. And so the word alcoholic is very useful because it's like, oh, well, if you're one of them, oh, you should never have done it then. You shouldn't ever done it. If you're, oh, oh, everybody else, you just do what you want. Drink with impunity. Don't worry about it. You're fine. You're, you're lucky. You got away. You dodged the bullet. But that's not the truth, is it? It's not, it's not, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. It is. And if you drink, you're on the spectrum. So talking about alcohol use disorder, if you imagine the bell curve, You've got people that drink little to nothing at one end, and then you've got most uh, drinkers in the middle. And then at the far end, you've got people that would have a physical dependency on alcohol, which I don't know the figures off the top of my head, but it tends to be, um, you know, I think there's a concern. We hear this a lot within the kind of programs that we're coaching people that think they are kind of at the extreme end and really it's very very few people that are at that extreme end of that extreme portion it's like i think normally it depends because it's science it depends which study you look at but like 10 to 20 percent of the people at the very 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 far end may be you know and if we were unsure it's always good to go and talk to a doctor of course it is but that's the reality of how many mm. people might need an actually kind of like a drug assisted detox for example yeah 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 so, you know, if, if, if you're a drinker, then you're in that middle bit somewhere. Yeah. And what we're talking about is whether, whether you like to recognize it as such or not, it, it is an addictive drug. That's exactly what it is. And I was talking to somebody recently about moderation and it's, I always kind of like have this like, I feel like I want to laugh when I say moderation, because how can you moderate an addictive substance? You know, we've talked, we've done episodes on moderation and no doubt we'll talk about it again. But it, to me, it's just, it's so nonsensical because you, how can you moderate a substance that calls for more of the same? How can you call for, uh, how can you moderate a substance that wants more of the same to achieve the desired effect? Like it, it it's, it's a very, uh, very difficult, if not impossible thing. And so if you think about, if you're a drinker and you're on that bell curve somewhere and you may be able to sit within the government guidelines, you may think that you're drinking responsibly, but a really good question to consider, and it doesn't have to be a question that you ask yourself out loud, it's just something for contemplation. Are you drinking more now or less now than a year ago two years ago five years ago 10 years ago because typically what we don't see is people drinking less over time we see people drinking more over time and it's this sort of sense of like it catches up with you and then oh hang on a minute was, this is certainly how it felt for me it was like oh my god like how how on earth did I get here I was just a big social drinker and now all of a sudden I'm finding it really, really difficult to go more than one or two nights a week without drinking. Like, what? how the hell did this happen? So it, it can catch up with you very, very quickly. Yeah, and that's why I think it's important to get 
the balanced view out there because in my experience you know I, I wasn't as far as I was concerned I wasn't gonna even if I had someone might have described me as drinking alcoholically or in that kind of way I would never have associated with that I just didn't find it useful um and but because I was you kind of say oh well I'm not one of those things that you have a concept of I'm not one of them and so you kind of like yeah, but in the meantime, you may be slipping and insidiously like moving, you know, kind of innocently down down this kind of spectrum to more and more problematic drinking where it's consuming you and taking over your life. And instead of looking at what's going on, you're comparing yourself against this made up idea of an alcoholic or whatever the word might be. And, and look, just to be clear, I think it's really easy for people to tag, you know, so traditional ways traditional ways of stopping drinking be it aa or 12 steps or whatever it might be there's all these different ways some people choose to use the word alcoholic some people don't some people use sober you know our the title of this podcast is sober right but we all have our own decisions around the words that we do and don't use but the 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 kind of thing that seems important to me is to to look at the reality of it you know we don't have cigarette holics we don't have cocaine holics we don't have any of that stuff we don't we 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 don't just like drink for a while and then one day you're like ta-da oh oh i'm an alcoholic now like it doesn't work like that it's a it's a it's like you're not smoking 10 a day and then one day you wake up and you smoke 20 and you're like oh shit i'm a cigarette holic now it's just not mm. and so it plays into this stigma so i think everybody do you if if the word alcoholic is useful or addict is useful or sober is useful or gray area drink is useful or whatever it is it, it doesn't matter it's just the word like you you literally get to make up what it means to you to me that's what a lot of sober rebellion meant it was like you're you do what you want anyone who knows me knows that I have a you know have an, and will continue to have like a really powerful relationship with um plant medicines and healing and 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 to me like some people say well how could you how could you possibly go around saying that you're sober or this or you know teetotals another word right go and look at them go and make a decision around what works for you or what doesn't you get to decide and um mm. the question is is it allowing you to look at what's going on in your life and make empowering choices right or does it feel like mm. a box does it feel like something that's been stuck on you um because because again just because some like maybe there's a word that you use that puts like it feels like it puts distance between you and alcohol for example but there may be fear underpinning that it might be oh I don't ever want to do that because I'm scared of what might happen so we accidentally make our lives smaller which is really different to going oh here's my word that feels empowering alcohol free mm. you know whatever it is for you here's the thing that feels opening and expansive to me that's not fueled by fear it's fueled by hope and it's fueled by love and it's fueled by life um, that's the metric I think we should be looking at. We should yeah. be aware of the fact that there are certain words that on the whole are, are, are a bit more loaded than others though, because of culture and history and, you know, and that's just how it is. So, mm. yeah. Mm. I love what you say about the importance of how it feels. I, re I remember when I was towards like the tail end of my drinking, there was a documentary recorded by a guy called Adrian Childs and it was called Drinkers Like Me and I saw it come up on Sky, recorded it and then in fact it was probably about a year before I stopped drinking, it was, it was a, a decent amount of time, it just sat recorded haunting me on the Sky box, you know, so I'd like flick through the what am I going to watch tonight and I would see it there and I would think I've clearly recorded that for a reason, right, because I'm, I'm on the lookout for some information <laughs> but I was scared to watch it because I was scared of what it might mean and and I didn't know where I'd go from there and so it was kind of easier to play dumb and to hide away from it and kind of kid myself along for a bit you know all of the oh, not that bad and look look I've taken expanses of time off in pregnancy look I've taken the three days off that we're asked to take off a week I can I can do it I just don't like doing it so when that was the only thing available to me the only thing that I had sought out to a degree it wasn't particularly helpful because it was amplifying that fear that was underlying whereas the entry point for me that was really 
impactful was with this naked mind because it wasn't about being shamed it wasn't about being fearful it was a an opening into deepening and broadening my understanding of how alcohol worked with the brain and body information I just I simply didn't know and it just blew the doors off it absolutely blew the doors off and it then became curiosity right hang on a minute if I've been wrong about this what else have I been wrong about the other feeling that came along with it was excitement it was like wow this is this is a bit subversive this is a bit different I'm excited to see where this might go and what what it might create for me in my life and there was also this overriding feeling of relief of like I don't have to fucking do this anymore I don't have to do this anymore so I that you know that that was my experience and I'm sure that it it's going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people but equally if that's not your route and your route is a is the fear-based route like fear and uh, pain is a good motivator it's just you know how sustainable is that so it, it can be helpful in the short term in all likelihood you're going to require some willpower but if that's the thing that gets the the you know the fire under you then all power to you you know this podcast is all about the coming together of lots of different views and opinions and experience within the sober community within the alcohol free community we're not necessarily pro one way or another we can talk about our own experience and the thing that's been really interesting for me in my so I'm coming at what I don't know two and a half years or something now I would have in the very beginning I was very careful around the words that I used because I, I suppose I still felt quite raw on the outside and there were words like alcoholic even sober to a degree kind of irritated me a bit because it had a feeling tone attached to it which was all my stuff it was you know my, my own layer of thoughts around what those words the connotations those words brought with them and so I wouldn't have described myself as sober I would have described myself as alcohol free mm-hmm. and I I felt very uh, very against using the word alcoholic partly because of it being a label but the interesting thing was that over time, as I've gone on my own personal spiritual growth journey, there's come a, it's come, come to a point where, the like I said earlier on, that words and language are important. But there comes a point where it, it doesn't matter because it's all made up. It's all made up. And when you know who you really are and what you really are and when you can dwell in that place it doesn't matter what anybody calls me or wants to label me as or use as a descriptor because I know I know the truth and I know what I am and I know who I am yeah and that's the thing and, and that's the that is the most important thing and ultimately if you're when you're trying on different words or whatever for the t- for the for the phase of whatever wherever you happen to be it's really you're entirely here's something that can be really useful to know is that you're entirely doing it for you like I think often we think we're doing it for others but if I go into a room and I go um you know I might walk into a room and it might be full of people who are like I don't know really well schooled in the science of alcohol or something like that like go into a room of coaches and someone might say um oh I yeah, I, I was an alcoholic or something, right? And then, and then everybody in that room will see what that means to them. But you go into another room and you say that you're that, and whatever you say, there people just hear their, you know, the word hit goes in. You know, it's like Scott talks about. You know, the word enters through our data, and the, uh, through our the, the raw data goes in through our perceptual system, and then in an instant. Whoosh, all the connections that that person has around that word are linked. Oh, I had a brother who did that. Oh, that was that. Oh, I read that book once. In, the, in, the, in a fraction of a, of a second, they are their reality is being built. So, you know, you, you're doing it for you. And ultimately, like Ellie said, the moment you know 
what's right for you it's kind of secondary it doesn't matter it doesn't really bother me what somebody thinks of me anymore I'd rather just be you know if I just am who I am the words are all completely secondary but they are they are at large out there in the kind of uh in the zeitgeist in the in the political movement in the there there is a bit of rebalancing to do that's kind of how it seems to me mm. it, it 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 kind of baffles me a bit that where it takes so long to for things to filter through and it just does it just does it takes a while right so we just have to do this work for ourselves first and be the you know be the version of mm. ourselves that we want to be and the rest of it is slowly taking care of itself it's not you know we can it's like annie says you know we're invited to do this stuff individually it's it's not like our responsibility to wear um because i would i would say that since i just let go of the accidental want to like go and try and you know make it make it right and you know fight the fight and just focused on me i think i've had way more impact through people just being like wow oh, yeah. you're so happy these days like what's going on you don't drink anymore really bloody hell that's pretty cool versus like you know me trying to go around and shove things down people's throats to make them see the world in a different way it's just really powerful to look inward it's really powerful to do that work it's in oh, my okay. experience way more powerful than fighting the fight um mm. but we all have our mm. own way of doing it right Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you said that I also went fuck yeah fuck yeah because that's that's really our one and only job is to do that inner work and if you think about the times in life where there are really terrible things going on in the world that you know we can all feel affected by and if you think about when we were raising money for the war in Ukraine, not for the war, but for the people that were um, impacted by the war in Ukraine. We talked to your good friend, Matt, and one of the things that had happened prior to that podcast recording was a, like a feeling of ho hopelessness and um, helplessness because, well, you know, we can do so much, but then, you know, how how long does that last for how many people does it really help it feels like it's a drop in the ocean and this whole point was yes it is it's a drop in the ocean it's the ocean it's still part of it hmm. and so you're so right the the attention and the energy we've got a finite amount at any point in time and we can either direct it towards like being on a crusade that was me in the old days I was always on a crusade for something and when you start directing that energy inward and using curiosity and compassion to was that your tummy no i, I think it was the chair tummy rumble there. that's you normally with the tummy rumbles yeah it is when you when you can start to face some of the things inside like what how we don't feel okay inside and you start to you start to make changes there it's profound how it affects your external world and so there are certain things that we might not be able to control or directly affect in the moment but that's not to say that you are helpless or hopeless and that you haven't got any kind of impact at all because you have yeah as an like yeah absolutely and as a nice way to to kind of wrap up this chat for now i think it's not so much that doesn't mean that you can't go flyering or protesting or write your letter to you whoever all that it's not about what you're doing it says nothing about what you're doing it's that it's the energy with which it's being done mm. and to go to one of my favorite mystics old sid banks i remember listening to something from him a couple of weeks ago where he said that before he'd had his kind of way awakening experience where he saw the world differently he had been constantly every day plagued by you know the the misjustices in in the civil rights movement and the misjustice in all of these different areas in politics and he was this kind of like angry scotsman who was walking around and he was like oh god like uh you know i've got this is unfair and that's unfair and i'm gonna intellect like talk about it at an intellectual level and he said it's really funny that um he was convinced that he had to like go out there and 
change the world in that way. But the moment he had this awakening experience and he entirely just leant inwards, let go of all of that, just filled himself with love and understanding, he suddenly started attracting people. And he was like, he did more in, you know, within a year of him having that experience, he'd done more for the collective consciousness and the planet that he had done in the preceding 50 years or or whatever Mm. it was before he saw that. So it's, we have this idea that Mm. it's sort of selfish and we need to go out there and fight the fight. It says nothing of that. It's just you realizing that it's really powerful to be in the garden, in joy, in love, being you, and just, you know, change the world in your your own way that way. Mm. And that is sustainable and renewable versus that kind of crusading energy is it's it's finite it's volatile it's you know it 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 might be effective but not for the long term there there is a really different way and it's a much it's a much more peaceful existence which means that you can do more and then what word you use and when people ask if you're an alcoholic it just won't it it just doesn't matter as much you can just say what makes sense to you in the moment rather than your kind of like peace because you like it, it kind of just uh yeah awesome i love that it was such a nice chap and i didn't expect it to, i didn't we hadn't really th- the way it, where it went to is put a smile on my face because i think that's really mm. cool mm. That's because we're cool. <laughs> oh God! Before you start doing that, I'm cool thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it off. <laughs> right. Have a lovely well, day. I'm people. cool. You're not. <laughs> Love you all. Love you all. <laughs>